Today we're unveiling some new testing tools alongside some updates to our GPU testing methodology that includes things like new game testing, new approaches to our version of game testing, and then also, again, the new tools. And those include, well, this for one, which is part of a new Schlieren imaging system that we've built for this round of cooler testing that allows us to do imaging of the density gradient across the air surrounding a GPU cooler. We also purchased a solution for GPU and CPU cooler reviews that will allow us to do 3D pressure maps. So we can already do pressure sensing on coolers to determine, for example, how well a GPU cooler fits against the die. But the solution that we just bought allows us to take the pressure film, produce a point-by-point -point pressure map with PSI or whatever measurement we want to use, and then also translate that into basically uh, a 3D model of the cooler cold plate. So that would be something like a Founders Edition cold plate as it connects to the silicon or the device it's cooling. So there's a lot to talk about today. Uh, we are doing our somewhat annual GPU methodology update. And the purchases of these new types of tools that get us outside of just sort of the, the usual benchmarking that we've always done and into some new interesting stuff, it's really made possible by the store support and the Patreon support. So thank you, everyone, for that. Genuinely, we couldn't afford this stuff without the money from the store.gamersnexus.net purchases for things like mouse mats, toolkits, mod mats, and all of that stuff. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. Okay, so this is a testing methodology piece. That means it is a referential piece that we'll be linking back to. We like to release these as offering a bit of transparency to the processes. It helps people understand things like what game settings we're using, what's the base hardware we're using. We're updating our test bench, by the way, finally from 8086Ks to some new stuff, including one AMD bench and one Intel one, depending on what we're testing for PCI generation reasons. And uh, it also gives you just sort of a, a list of the stuff we've got going on for any given review and better understand the type of data we're able to, to produce and, and how we produce it so that uh, if you would like to do some follow along at home with your own devices, hopefully you can follow some of the basics of our methods and get most of the way to uh, determining how your computer compares to the ones we're testing with to help make decisions on the purchases. Uh, that does mean it's going to be long, though, because methodology pieces always are. So the new stuff. Outside of new games and everything else, the imaging's new. We're doing additional work with flow testing. Uh, we're doing the same acoustic testing we've always done for GPUs, so that's good. It's, it's been pretty well liked, and we'll keep that as is. And we're doing the same teardowns and mechanical uh, looks at components as we get them into. Right now, we're not allowed to take apart the 3080 on camera. Uh, actually, at time of filming, I haven't taken it apart. and. Once the embargo lifts, we'll be able to do that. So you'll see that as part of the review process. All right, so let's get into it. We'll start with a look at a test matrix that we put together. This sort of helps us uh, keep track of what we have to do for a GP review. We don't normally publish stuff like the test matrix for competitive reasons largely uh, because we put a lot of work into it. It's normally a couple months of worth, work of testing and validation and throwing away games that are just kind of hard to work with and adding new ones. So it takes a long time. And that said, though, we're confident in the testing and we're happy to share it at this point. So our biggest challenge going forward as you look at this matrix of tests is that we're going to have to figure out how to fit some of this into a 28 to 36 minute period for a review of a GPU. For a flagship, we're OK with stretching up to about 36 minutes. But for, for the most part, we prefer to keep the GP reviews, video reviews, under 30. And that's going to be a huge challenge. It means we're going to cut a lot of this stuff. So just seeing the test matrix doesn't mean all that's going to be in every video. It means that we're doing all of it. And then we're going to get to the end and go, does this really tell us a story that's more interesting than that? Because we're going to have to make cuts somewhere. Uh, so that's the challenge we run into. So this quick zoomed out look at the test matrix. The columns are test case ID, which corresponds with the test case guides for the specific benchmark or test listed. We have the test type, the standard operating procedure document that we've written for each test. So uh, it's conducted exactly the same way, step by step each time, even if a different person runs the test. Uh, 
the primary testing parameters, the secondary if there are any, the minimum number of executions or the duration depending, and the people who are qualified to do the testing. So that'd just be uh, the name listed representing who's been trained to do a particular test or who's required to set up or conduct a particular test. If we zoom in to just the GPU game testing suite alone, you'll see that we're running three resolutions for every device except the lowest end ones. So a GTX 1660, for example, or maybe an RX 580, would run low enough that we might not do 4K for all the tests. 580 kind of slides by sometimes, but you'll see that we'll drop 4K for some of the cards if they're low end enough. So Red Dead Redemption 2, for example, Flight Simulator 2020, uh, they're running additional sets of game settings or APIs for the three resolutions. So to put this into perspective, that means the RTX 3080, for example, will produce enough data to generate 41 charts for just games alone. That's at three resolutions per game with some running two sets of settings. So this is obviously ridiculous and we're not going to bore everybody with 41 charts for just games in every review video. So here's the strategy to it. Our goal with collecting all the data, even if we're not using it, is that we can start aggregating it into other stuff. So we can do API versus API comparisons to show scaling, stuff like that. And then suddenly you're taking maybe three to six charts and, and compressing them down into one that maybe provides a little bit uh, more of a condensed look at the same type of thing. And this isn't necessarily the best way to do it, but it's the way that we're doing it right now. Our goal is going to be to focus on data from these numbers, which is either very interesting or very useful. Very useful in our mind would be like representative of the whole. So let's say we leave some game in there that tends to perform like most of the other games in the suite, but we've left it in because it is popular uh, and or because it is representative on an API that's common of the rest of the game's testing that we, we might include. And that would allow us to make cuts elsewhere if we think that multiple games are starting to tell the same story. And okay, everyone gets it. Let's cut these. And let's throw something interesting in there too. Maybe Strange Brigade, which people don't really play, provides an interesting look at Vulcan and DX12, for example, that might be able to inform us as to how the architectures behave as opposed to just how the gaming performance looks like, uh, even though it is ultimately a, a based on a game in that scenario. So with that in mind, our criteria for showing scaling, which is ultimately our goal is to show relative performance scaling between devices, not necessarily the absolute FPS numbers. Uh, what we can kind of takeaway is that we want to look at different APIs. We want to look at behavior as resolution scales up or down and behavior in games that have different features. RTX might be one of them, uh, or you could look at something else entirely like potentially something that's more latency intensive to give a completely different metric altogether from the usual FPS. Another thing we started doing last generation that we'll explore again is those combined charts. So rather than presenting Red Dead Vulcan and the X12 individually, we might find that it's more useful or interesting to combine them into a single chart. And back to the matrix, not that one, but we have 210 or so total test passes to run for a high-end video card just for games if we run all of them. And again, we're probably gonna drop some here and there depending on timing and things like that. So not counting a couple hours of thermal, acoustic, and mechanical testing, just the games alone, it's gonna take probably most of a day between the three of us who are able to run these types of tests. And we're also in the process of adding some RTX games, but ray tracing performance will still be limited in scope for us and won't take much time of reviews unless we see a serious uplift in interest from the audience. That may be something we'll explore more in follow-up content. We feel like a lot of the RTX stuff is better suited to one-off focused pieces, for example, on DLSS on versus off, rather than bloating a whole review with DLSS on off or RTX on off because that's, it really makes a lot more sense standalone where we can focus on it. Right now, the RTX games list for us is, is pretty simple, but it's fairly representative. We have uh, Minecraft and Control, both of which have DLSS enabled for our testing, and we'll talk more about the settings when the review time comes. Those are still getting figured out right now. Then we also have Quake 2, just uh, kind of easy to run, and it's amusing. And then finally, we, we do have one fourth game, and that's just Shadow of the Tomb Raider, no DLSS. So there's no DLSS, Quake 2, and Tomb Raider, and then it is applied for control. We honestly, Patrick and I talked about this, we weren't sure what to do with regard to RTX and DLSS testing because we haven't paid too close attention to the community development of RTX usage over the last two years. 
And so we put a poll out to YouTube and Twitter and basically uh, like on YouTube community section, we got a lot of answers. Do you enable DLSS when you play or not? And a lot of the people who said they did enable it, it was specifically in control. So that's where we added it and enabled it because it seems like a lot of people actually use it there. That said, our focus is still mostly on other types of performance, but hopefully that'll give you enough of a cross section where if you really care about RTX, you can get uh, a basic look at relative performance. And then if you want more, well, you'll have to check back for one-off pieces on specific games uh, as people you know, show significant interest. Cyberpunk would be a great example of one that has significant interest. Our next section of the test matrix is power testing. And for this one, we've had our own interposers for power testing that we hand built last year. We've already been doing GPU PCIe slot draw and cable draw since before NVIDIA's PCAT tool that you've likely heard of, like from Linus, for example. That said, we are presently in the process of validating PCAT to see if it may be a useful addition or a replacement for our custom tools that we made. Ours work pretty well. Power is power. It's very easy to measure in that sense of things. Uh, but they are slow to use, at least ours are. So we may look into NVIDIA PCAT a bit more. For power right now, at least, we're running nine total tests. We're not sure yet if we're going to produce an aggregate gaming result or if we're just going to present them separately. We'll figure that out based on the length of the videos. We've also formally added Blender Cycles rendering to this one. We've used that in CP reviews for ages, as you all know. Uh, we prefer to use our own custom-built benchmarks for this just because Andrew on our team does a lot of work with Blender, and he's been working with it for years. We have some specific optimizations and use case scenarios that we think are representative of uh, quote unquote real Blender users because Andrew is one. And so we use our own benchmarks for that. But these are carried over from CPU reviews. We've made tweaks to them. They're not directly comparable. Uh, so do keep that in mind. But they are comparable for GPUs alone. And then for CPUs alone, we might do something else later. So with that, we've modified our GN monkey heads render from the CPU reviews and our GN logo render to execute on GPUs in a way that does show scaling. We're not sure if this will make it into the 3080 review on launch day. It'll just depend on how smoothly the testing goes. We're trying to get it out there in that review, but right now we're absolutely slammed with testing and we've been rerunning a lot of stuff just for various reasons. So with Blender, we're now testing using both Optics, or that's RT cores, and CUDA for NVIDIA. And then we're testing with OpenCL for AMD cards. Sometimes Optics doesn't work. Sometimes OpenCL doesn't work. It depends a little bit on the card and the generation. Blender can also do CPU and GPU rendering now, but we strongly advise against it. Generally speaking, you should be rendering with two separate instances if you want to load both of the components. That's because it's tile-based. So optimizing tile sizes for GPUs means that they're too large for the CPU cores. And the CPU cores end up sitting on most of the tiles in the frame while the GPU quickly pushes through one at a time. So let's say for CPUs, you optimize to something like 16 by 16 tile sizes for your project, and you have a, an ultimate resolution which is divisible by that amount, that tile size. Problem is GPUs tend to work better, at least the higher end ones, with larger tile sizes in the data sets we're working with. The GPUs tend to be about peak performance at 128 by 128. Some of them do better at 256, but they seem to show diminishing returns at 128 by 128. So the issue with Blender the way it's built right now is if you run CPU and GPU Blender on the same animation, you're going to end up with, uh, you have to pick one of the two tile sizes. If you do 16 by 16, you're spinning off all these tiles that the CPU is going to sit on and process much more slowly in most cases than a GPU will. The GPU is only doing one at a time. And so you end up in a scenario where at the end of the render, once you've churned through everything except the final 16, CPU is sitting on all of them, the GPU is doing nothing. So we'd recommend splitting the renders. And for that reason, we think it, it makes a bit more sense to look at the CPU render benchmark standalone and the GPU standalone and extrapolate from there if, if you're a user for that scenario. Uh, one final note here in the sort of workstation section we're carving out. We want to add more to workstation testing. We're interested in it but we're not ready yet, so Blender is it for now. That said, if you are an actual user of some kind of workstation application and you feel like maybe benchmarks for it are underrepresented for how popular it is, please let us know in the comments. This is the, the most helpful thing you could do for us this video. Let us know if you are a professional in some sort of workstation application which is dependent upon GPU performance. What applications do you use? And is there anything we need to know about getting them to perform in a way with GPUs which is useful or conducive to producing data 
that you can then judge a purchase on. That's what we could use your help with because we're not really outside of what we do. We're not production users. We're not data scientists or researchers or anything like that. Uh, so your help there would be greatly appreciated and we can look into some of those for including in the future for production tests. Okay, let's move on past the workstation stuff and into another part of testing. And this part is really exciting to us. So airflow, air pressure and radiation or uh, in quotes here, heat testing. We'll have a full video coming up on this system and we can't really reveal much now because most of the testing we've done has been on the 3080 and we can't show that unless it's off. Although technically it's off in some of the images we took, but we're not gonna spoil them yet. We're not ready yet. Uh, so the full team spent a day building our Schlieren imaging system to capture images of basically airflow. We'll describe this more in our RTX 3080 Schlieren imaging debut, but the basics are pretty simple. By using a point light and an expensive parabolic mirror, along with some other tricks, we're able to pierce the point light through density gradients that are present near the device under test. So in perfectly still, sterile air, we wouldn't see much of anything other than the device. And that's mostly in black and white, although we can use gels like for film to create a, a hue on the images that we're looking at. So uh, this will allow us to look at things like air density change as uh, enacted by the sort of mini pressure systems that fans on a GPU create or that the heat from the device creates. We can visualize how that air interacts with GPUs, CPU coolers, and more. Uh, like we said, this is something we just finished filming a separate video on, so you'll hear more about this setup, and we'll save it for the 3080 follow-up content. Today, we're not allowed to show 3080 performance powered on, but we do have some quick captures of other types of tests to give an idea of how this system behaves. And to really drive this one home, uh, this is part of it. It's, it's turned around right now, the mirror's on the other side. But this came together in literally one day. Really impressed with the team. So Andrew, Patrick, Keegan, and I all worked on it. Mike got in there as well and helped out. And uh, it was amazing how fast it came together. So basically, I came up with the idea on a Thursday at midnight. We, and this was predicated by seeing some media about the efficacy of masks, for example. They use a similar solution. And then overnight, shipped that uh, mirror and mount, this one right here, out to us. And then Andrew, Patrick Keegan, everyone took turns assembling it. Uh, Andrew, though, huge shout out, spent uh, a lot of hours here doing it. It was a very extensive process. So uh, we have some really cool data collection we can do with this, and you'll need to give us some time. Again, we just got this in. There's a steep learning curve. We're still figuring out how to use the Schlieren imaging system that we built. It's really simple on the base of things, but the, the part that we need to learn isn't really like the, the practice of positioning it and taking the footage. It's the how do we produce good data with it? That's kind of the hard part. So we've done some initial imaging of the 3080 and we'll include that in follow-up coverage. And then you're just gonna have to give us some time because we really want to test some other devices, but it takes literally the entire studio to set this up. And so we've kind of got one shot for maybe about a six hour period before it needs to be torn down and uh, I have to film something. Uh, so big challenges with that, which are mostly not solvable. We would need more space and the other challenge is because it relies on a mirror, that means there's kind of a limit to how real world we can be, but we can still produce useful information on an open air bench and we can kind of simulate a semi-closed bench if we enclose this uh, structure with basically fake case panels. What we can't do is we can't put something like a motherboard behind the GPU because it would block the mirror and thus the image and be useless. So there are limitations to this, uh, but we are confident that we can find some, some cool ways to leverage this for actually useful takeaways. It's just gonna take us a little bit to, to figure it out. So give us some time on that, but the 3080 will be the debut of this system. Next up for the methodology, some information on our imaging and pressure systems. This is more about what you can look forward to and for the individual testing approaches, we'll be publishing additional follow-up pieces in the future as we collect more data. But basically what we do is we take some pressure paper that is chemical reactive, we place it between the cold plate and the silicon or whatever's being measured, and with some careful adjustment of things to make sure we don't trigger the paper in the process of handling it, we then remount the cooler and uh, uh, typically take an approach where we tighten each of the screws about 10% at a time. So it's about 10 total turns, in other words, to get all the screws for contact back to where they originally were. And we also, wherever we can, get the torque spec for the screws that were, you know, where they were originally placed for 
uh, socket tension. But we can't always get the torque spec, so when we can't get it, we take our own torque driver, torque Phillips head screwdriver, whatever's needed, and just sort of adjust it until we find roughly where the torque is. That way we can put it all back in place the way it came off. So uh, for the imaging system, most of you probably don't remember the AMD pressure mounting coverage we did, where we used pressure paper to show the cooler contact to the silicon. The reason we did this at the time was because Vega had three different types of packaging. Sometimes the HBM was flush with the GPU and had a resin epoxy type of layer. Other times it had no layer at all or the HBM was lower than the GPU. This was dependent on which fab the package came out of. So with pressure testing, we were able to show how some GPU packages were able to get full flush contact while others left the HBM almost entirely unconnected to the cooler uh, in the worst cases or in the best cases contacted by thermal pad to the cooler. So we've improved on that. Now we can actually produce 3D images of the pressure and line maps of a given point on a cooler and histogram. So this screen capture of our new imaging software shows that. It's not the best example, but this is one of the scans of an AMD Vega GPU. We'll show a cooler in a minute for CPUs. And you can see the original scan compared to the pseudo color image. This shows the pressure colorized in a way which allows us to produce height maps against a calibrated set of pressure paper colors. We can also produce 3D images to help visualize the pressure. Remember, this isn't technically showing the height of the cooler of the GPU, despite using the phrase height map here. It's showing the pressure. So it's possible to have a relatively flat plate that still has bad pressure, especially on a CPU cooler. So that would be due to mounting hardware in that instance. But this is only one part of the equation, and that's the pressure part. We have another tool for measuring the depth of the cold plate at various points. This tool is currently set to showing PSI, but we may change the unit in, in the future. We can also draw a line on any section of the pseudo color image to produce a PSI map for that line. This is helpful for finding exactly where things go wrong. This scanning solution is calibrated by a professional institution that deals with calibration of pressure papers. So the whole setup cost us about $8,000. The calibration was a major part of that. Many of you who uh, do work in labs where you do deal with calibration are likely familiar with the costs of calibration and the opportunity cost of sending a thing out. So that's not going to be fun in the future. But Calibration was a major part of it. The training of the software was another major part of it, the licensing, all that. So you really pay a lot for the setup. But uh, this one is an easier to see example. This is an AMD Wraith cooler, but it's an old one. It's one that has four heat pipes on the bottom, and it's not a flat cold plate that is connected to them. So this shows why you really need thermal paste, because it's extremely uneven pressure across the surface. And it's bad contact, too, for this one. This cold plate has particularly bad contact because it's direct touch heat pipes uh, to the CPU IHS. So we're really excited to introduce all this as part of the CPU cooler and the GPU cooler reviews going forward. We'll try and do it for all of them that we look at. It's going to depend on how much time we have for each one. It does require teardown. It requires multiple mounts and remounts. And that's obviously a huge pain. So uh, not particularly fast to do, and there's zero way to automate this. It has to be done by a human. So we'll, we'll try our best to get this in all of them. It's definitely going to be in the RTX 3080 review, though, uh, or in follow-up content, depending on how, we, how, how much stuff we have to get through. And not to plug it too much, but again, the cost of this thing is so high that uh, it's really only possible because of the store.gamersnexus.net purchases and because of the patreon.com slash gamersnexus purchases. So thank you to everybody over the years who's supported us in either one of those ways, especially uh, recently with the toolkits selling through. That helps offset a lot of this cost. But we have them on back order. If you want to pick up one of our GN toolkits, they're focused on high quality. They're on back order. But I'm going to get back to the content here. So we do have a way to take measurement of cold plate flatness as well. And it's already in use in our CPU cooler reviews. We'll put one of those charts on the screen. We take point measurements along the cooler surface from a known zero point and then measure the depth from the zero point in microns. These results are for CPU coolers, but we can also use this on GPU coolers. Actually, it's even more useful for GPU coolers because their plates are already flat since they're direct die contact with flat silicon. So we're not dealing with accounting for intentionally concave or convex designs like in CPU coolers. OK, so let's get into games now. For game testing this time, we've completely changed our list of games to include these. We have Horizon Zero Dawn. That's new this time, DX12 for that. Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 using DX11. We're testing Ultra and High, and we're doing a flight path of New York City to Philadelphia. 
Red Dead Redemption 2 with DX12 and Vulcan being tested. The Division 2 with DX12 being tested. Uh, Rainbow Six Siege is new as a flight sim. And Rainbow Six Siege is a DX11 title. F1 2019 is still in there. It's reliable. It's DX12. GTA 5 is still in there. Yes, it's at this point, it's just kind of funny, so we're leaving it. But it's still one of the top 10 games on Steam. Hitman 2 is in there because it shows some useful scaling in some scenarios. Total War Three Kingdoms Battle is in there as an RTS representation at, uh, with DX12. Strange Brigade for DX12 and Vulcan. This isn't here because we think it's popular, but because it has DX12 and Vulcan, so uh, we wanted something we could use to, to look at some architectural performance. And then Shadow of the Tomb Raider with DX12 just because it's one we've been using for a while and it's reliable. We're running three resolutions for each of those games, except in instances where it just doesn't make sense. So if we're reviewing a $100 GPU, $150 GPU, we're probably not testing it at 4K. It's very likely those really cheap ones, we're only testing at 1080p. So likewise, if we're reviewing a $1,500 GPU, there's a good chance we start dropping 1080p charts after we establish the point and in instead focus on ones that actually show some kind of performance delta. So some of these games are new to our suite and they've all had their own unique problems. Horizon Zero Dawn, for example, this is, I think, pretty public at this point. People have run into this already. But it has some unique issues when applying settings that need to be cared for to ensure valid data. We've seen some issues with resolution uh, settings taking like improperly applying basically. So this has been something we've had to keep an eye out for. It's pretty easy to notice. Most experienced reviewers and testers will see bad data when it's there because it, you're going to be like, how did, why is, why are the numbers the same as 4K when it's 1080? So it should be pretty obvious, but that doesn't make it any less of a pain in the ass to use. Uh, we've also added Microsoft Flight Simulator. This one's a challenge for us. So Flight Sim has trouble scaling on the CPU. A single thread gets slammed for most tests, even running on the 10700K CPUs at 5.1 gigahertz and with tuned memory settings. We think that maybe further memory upgrades will help in some scenarios like this, but this game really is a pretty single threaded test in a lot of ways, at least the scenario we chose. If you run a CPU monitoring tool while running the test, you'll see one thread constantly stuck at 100% load in these more geometrically complex areas. We tried tweaking the settings a little bit and partially alleviated this issue, but we're still working on figuring out the best settings for testing flights and for GPUs. We may end up leaving it unmodified though, even though it's of limited usefulness. And that's because for our CPU reviews, we have some games like Red Dead at high, where the data ends up being actually useless in the sense of a CPU comparison. But it's useful as a reality check or reminder that at some point you're gonna be bound by another component. In that sense, with our Red Dead bench set to high for CPU reviews, what you really see is that at some point, the GPU matters more. To that end, we may leave Flight Sim as a reminder of that uh, CPU limitation for some games. Anyway, here's an example of the current data we're looking at for Flight Sim. As you can see, everything is stuck at about the same level of performance with this example data set. This means that we're CPU bound, not GPU bound, and so the data is not actually useful for determining which GPU is the best. Rather, what it's determining is that we need a faster CPU, or a game, or a scenario that's less single-threaded, or settings that minimize that dependency. This is obviously not useful for a GPU comparison, and we try to avoid these scenarios. We normally delete tests that look like this, and they never see the light of day. But publishing this intentionally bad data helps you understand our process and why we eliminate some tests or make changes. In this one, clearly, a 1080 Ti is not ever better than a 2080 Ti, and a 2060 KO is most certainly not better than any of the cards it's listed ahead of. That's why this test isn't useful for picking a GPU, aside from proving a point that, sometimes, you are going to be CPU bound, and that the GPU doesn't matter that much. The good news here is that the game is scoring consistently within the confines of the GPU. Average FPS standard deviation is 1.0, 1% low standard deviation is 1.6, and 0.1% low is 1.3 FPS standard deviation. Overall, STDEV was predictably the most variable on an overclock and in 1% and 0.1% low values, as always. But the obvious bigger issue is being unable to actually differentiate GPUs in the other chart. Additional good news is that we're seeing clean scaling at 4K where there are obvious increments northbound with graphics power increases. Unfortunately, at 49 FPS average here for the top performer, that's not going to leave us much room for scaling with newer cards. We know the CPU hits a wall around 53 to 55 with these settings, so we may have to restructure the game to make it work. One interesting way to flip the script on this one might be to take 
the Microsoft Flight Sim issue and leverage it in a new way. And that might be to look at instead power consumption at a fixed FPS. It's a little screwy, but it might produce interesting data. So we could use this as an example of sort of FPS normalized power consumption. Why not? It's already there. But it's not particularly interesting to most people. We don't think anyway. Maybe it is. But uh, it would be a good way, though, to gauge the efficiency of a given GPU at a given frame rate, because then you can start looking at the power consumption numbers when it's capped somewhere else. So it's meeting the capabilities as permitted by the CPU, which is gating the performance. And then we can look at the power needed to accomplish the same amount of performance. Blender would be better for this. It's uh, easier to control, but it'd still be kind of fun. Maybe it's a separate piece. As always, we'll continue to present our charts with average FPS, 1% lows, and 0.1% lows, the latter two measurements being ones that we uh, sort of tweaked for calculation with custom software that we built internally. Games are tested with multiple passes for validation, and we always restart games between things like graphic settings changes because failing to do so can cause bad data. All that's old news. We've been doing these things for at least eight years now, but it's worth reminding everyone once again if you're new here. For software, we're now running on Windows version 2004, and without using, that is version 2004 of Windows 10, not but not the year 2004. And that's without using the new GPU latency feature that we previously found provided minimal uplift. We've performed additional validation from what we typically do and ran the first set of GPUs on two identical test benches to ensure that they produced identical results. And they did. We were often within one FPS. This is awesome if you look at these charts. We were typically within run-to-run -run variants. Uh, like even if you tested on the same system, for example, you'd be getting the same numbers. So this simple chart shows you that some of the aggregate differences between the test platforms are just, they're, they're so phenomenally low, we're pretty happy with it. This was with two separate motherboards, two separate CPUs, two separate kits of RAM and SSDs, but they're all identical parts. It's just that uh, the model's the same for the board, CPU, RAM, power supply, everything else, but the physical unit is different. The results cross-validated. So we're confident in the testing procedure, and we now have a secondary bench that we can fall back on. So that's the cool thing with this. The secondary bench isn't really that interesting from a viewer standpoint, because it's not like it's producing new stuff for you. It's interesting from our standpoint, because if we run into a scenario where we're like, these numbers, just, they, they don't make sense, but they keep happening, and we can't figure it out. So now we've got this other bench over here. We pull it out and say, you know what? This is validated. It gets the exact same numbers every single time or within about 1%. And that's kind of the same range you're in anyway with the primary test platform. So it gives us another way to just very quickly make sure there's not an issue deeper in the hardware with the host platform or the OS. Because the OS, we're also able to, to more easily keep clean versions around so we can more easily just kind of check things if there is a, a weird set of numbers to see if it's a game software issue or if it's some other issue that we need to fix before publication. And finally, for the methodology, the most pedestrian part of all of this is the test benches that we're using for GPU testing for games and everything else involved in between. There's a, a lot of benches involved in this process. We're going to name the primary ones. There's also an older thermal bench that we use, but the parts are irrelevant for it because it's just for GPU thermals. So we have three systems currently set up. You can find links to all the parts in the description below. The motherboards were just recently provided by ASUS for these as well. So the specs are ASUS Z490 Maximus 12 Hero motherboards for the Intel benches. We have Intel i7-10700Ks. We chose this CPU because we felt like it was the least likely to get retested in our CPU bench. Basically, it was the least valuable for other things, but the highest single core frequency capability after the 10900K. This is currently clocked to 5.1 gigahertz all core with all limits disabled and all voltages controlled. The CPU is gonna have a pretty tough life, so we didn't wanna push it further because it will be under load almost all the time. Next up, Corsair Vengeance 3200 megahertz memory with manually tuned frequency and manually tuned timings to improve both of those aspects. Every single timing exposed in BIOS is controlled between all of the benches. The Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 280 liquid cooler is in use as well. This was the highest performing cooler in one of our recent tests behind the 360s, and we wanted to give it an opportunity to get some endurance testing in as well for long-term use, so we put it on our, all of our benches. EVGA 1600 watt T2 power supplies are in use also because they don't have any current protections or OCP that we need to worry about. For the AMD platform, we're using the ASUS X570 Crosshair 8 for easier overclocking controls 
And for maintenance going forward, we're using the AMD R9 3900XT. We thought the 3900XT was mostly a useless launch compared to the value of the 3900X. And so we're the least likely to reuse it in CPU reviews. But disabling SMT intentionally and overclocking it gets us the highest performance we can get out of all of our current AMD CPUs we have available. With SMT off, we can maintain an overclock of 4.5 gigahertz on all 12 physical cores with timings manually tuned on the memory as well and Infinity Fabric tuned. We're still making a final memory decision at time of writing, but it's probably going to be the same kit as the Z490 bench. Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 280s are also in use here with the Kraken 280X62 as a backup. The AMD platform is not the one we're intending to use for most of the testing because Intel still, if you look at our CPU reviews, Intel, there's still a line in the sand where even when they're GPU bound in some games, the Intel numbers are a bit higher. And we want to make sure we're not constraining our GPU reviews by the CPU. So the AMD platform will be basically used for PCIe generational testing. And we can do some feature testing with it too to see if any particular card from a vendor performs better with one versus the other. But it's not planned to be used in all GPU reviews, mostly just for the flagship stuff where we're most likely to see an exit from PCIe generation three uh, bandwidth capabilities. And that should cover it for now. So thank you for watching our testing methodology update for 2020. This is the biggest single method update we've ever done for a CPU or GPU review. It's a lot of new tools in place. Really looking forward to getting them in use. And thank you for watching. You can support this type of stuff directly and our, uh, at this point, extremely high cost and investment into the methodology by going to store.gamersnexus.net, where you can pick up things like our mod mats for PC building. They are anti-static surfaces that are built by a factory that makes things for clean rooms. And you can also pick up our wireframe mouse mats, which are desk-sized mouse mats for use at your PC with components shown in wireframe form on them to fit the PC hobby. Uh, or patreon.com slash gamersnexus for behind-the-scenes videos. Subscribe for more. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.